Today, the crypto prices trade flat after a bumpy 24 hours. Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy rolls out a crypto policy framework aimed at cutting red tape. And Jonathan Levin of Chainalysis explains how he's helping lawmakers understand blockchain's role in fighting criminal financing. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World, I'm Tanea McKeel. Crypto prices are mixed this morning after swinging pretty wildly over the past 24 hours. By noon Eastern, Bitcoin was little changed, above $36,000. Ether dipped just slightly, but still held above $2,000, and XRP dropped to 62 cents. Okay, let's talk about the latest headlines. BlackRock has filed its proposed spot Ether ETF with the SEC. On Wednesday, the investment giant submitted its S1 registration form for the iShares Ethereum Trust, a fund that would track the price of Ether directly. The submission to the SEC comes after last week's filing with the NASDAQ to list the proposed fund on the exchange. Ether prices rallied after that previous filing, and they did so again briefly after yesterday's S1. Next, Do Kwan's appeal of the verdict in his fake passport case has been denied. In a statement on Thursday, the High Court in Montenegro called the Terraform co-founder's request to turn over his four-month prison sentence unfounded. It said the lower court correctly handed down that sentence after Do Kwan was found with forged passports and IDs. Of course, Do Kwan had been considered a fugitive since the collapse of Terra Luna last year. Prosecutors here in the U.S. are still working to get him extradited to face fraud charges. Finally, Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy has rolled out his plan for the crypto industry. Dubbed the Three Freedoms of Crypto, the framework promises far-reaching deregulation. The proposal calls for a 75% cut to the federal workforce, which would start with the SEC. Another pillar of the plan would be shielding developers of crypto projects from legal action, citing the sanctions of Tornado Cash and the subsequent charges against the crypto mixer's founders back in August. Ramaswamy would also oppose the creation of a central bank digital currency, or CBDC. This latest proposal is the most direct plan for the crypto industry put forth by a 2024 Republican presidential candidate, but it is also somewhat at odds with calls from GOP lawmakers for more regulation for the industry instead of less. President Biden put forth his own crypto framework in September of last year, which called for deeper consumer protections and law enforcement action, along with partnership between the SEC and CFTC. All right, let's stick with Washington's scrutiny of crypto for our main story. On Wednesday, the House Financial Services Committee held a hearing titled Crypto Crime in Context, breaking down the illicit activity in digital assets. Committee members called it a bipartisan fact-finding mission to figure out how to use blockchain to combat illicit activity. Crypto World's Jordan Smith spoke to Jonathan Levin, the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Chainalysis, and one of the witnesses in that hearing to find out what he wanted lawmakers to learn. All right, Jonathan, so I'm actually speaking to you ahead of your testimony in front of the House today. You're speaking to them on crypto's role in illicit finance. Can you just walk me through what you want Congress to take away from your testimony today? What's the most important points that lawmakers should hear? Yeah, sure. Great to be here. Really what the idea behind the hearing is to understand you know, how is crypto being used for illicit activity and really what can Congress do to prevent you know, illicit activity from happening in cryptocurrencies. And I think there's sort of three main takeaways. One is on the domestic policy side, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, domestic institutions have the right number of touch points with U.S. regulators and U.S. law enforcement. So making sure that there is you know, a real framework for digital asset regulation with, you know, single prudential regulators on specific types of activity is sort of a major point for, you know, both cryptocurrency exchanges and also for stablecoin issuers. Um, you know, when it comes to the international policy side, we're also you know, concerned about the abuse of you know, unlicensed money service businesses and sort of over-the-counter brokers in different jurisdictions that don't have um, proper oversight. And so helping the US government work more closely with partners around the world to tackle that threat. And finally, you know, there needs to be you know, greater resources dedicated to this new type of financial intelligence for the U.S. government. And you know, what we have shown is that with the right data, the right tools and the right support, governments around the world can actually be pretty successful at disrupting these illicit finance networks when it comes to cryptocurrency. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the knowledge gap there. Uh, there was a there was a point that Chainalysis made right at the start of the war between Israel and Hamas that the role crypto plays in terrorism financing is perhaps a little overstated. Can you talk about the ways that crypto 
uh, is tracked or, or used in, in financing terrorism and, and what work needs to be done to make sure that we have an accurate picture of how it's being used. Yeah. So when it comes to you know terror financing, really, this is about understanding both the use of cryptocurrency by terrorist organizations like Hamas and also the enablers and facilitators that allow them to get hands on that cryptocurrency or broader assets. So, you know, this is not a new problem. Really, you know, the task at hand is to identify those intermediaries and facilitators and make sure that there is disruption of that. The misconception and sort of the misunderstanding in general has been around, you know, understanding the specific use of terrorist organizations of cryptocurrencies for direct operational use or crowdfunding and the broader sphere of enablers and facilitators where not all of those funds necessarily are involved in the financing of terror. There are you know, other funds also um, that are being given to those facilitators and, and enablers because some of them are getting abused by terror organizations like Hamas. Yeah. You mentioned there's sort of a multi multifaceted approach to how regulators, lawmakers around the world uh, can approach this issue. Specifically in the U.S., though, I, I think there has been a really strong pushback to the crypto industry this year after a lot of the trouble that we saw in 2022. Are you having this dialogue with lawmakers now to make sure that they take the right approach, that they're not too aggressive? Is there any concern that they may overreact in terms of, of crypto regulation? Yeah, I think that there is a risk of of overreaction. You know, whenever something like this happens, there's you know headlines and uh, you know political pressures to to take some form of of action. And I think that you know the good thing is that you know the industry has been engaged on you know the substance of what goes into having a good market structure, what goes into actually being able to have a domestic stablecoin framework that allows for us to you know, continue to, to innovate and build in this space. And so I think that you know, the right things have happened in terms of you know, Congress you know, holding hearings to understand you know, what are the limitations of uh, these different you know, frameworks and abilities to prevent cryptocurrency being used for bad purposes and you know, what constructively can be done to encourage you know, more innovation domestically and for there to be greater regulatory clarity. Yeah, that goes right into my next question about how constructive the conversations have been with lawmakers ahead of this hearing and, and in just in general. Um, have they been receptive to some of these regulations that the industry have been asking for? Are they asking the right questions from your perspective or is there still work to be done? Yeah, I think for the most part, you know, there's been a, a massive increase in the level of sophistication of the questions and, you know, the ideas that are coming out of Congress. You know, we now have several sort of bills in circulation and, you know, some of them do obviously uh, need to be sort of fleshed out and worked on. But, you know, for the most part, you know, there is now a constructive dialogue happening between lawmakers in the industry on exactly what are the right principles to follow uh, when it comes to this. And, you know, I think that, you know, particularly on the money laundering side, you know, everyone agrees that a dollar is too much uh, when it comes to terrorist financing. Uh, but we do need to take a risk based approach on making sure that we allow for policymakers to understand the unique capabilities that come out of the blockchain and, you know, the unique challenges that are also presented. And, and finally, from a law enforcement perspective, um, has there been any, any dialogue from, say, Chainalysis on how to better um, provide information to law enforcement for, for tracking through the blockchain some of this illicit finance, whether it's financing terrorism or money laundering or any of the other issues that they're trying to track down when it comes to blockchain technology? What does the dialogue look like from a law enforcement perspective? Yeah, so, I mean, we've spent the best part of the last decade working with law enforcement agencies around the world on this very topic. And I think that, you know, we've moved from the world of which, you know, there was very little understanding in law enforcement to now there are sort of people in law enforcement who are experts in being able to follow the money in cryptocurrency and have been very successful at bringing cases. I think we're approaching sort of the next era of this, which is you know, not just having investigators that are very well trained and being able to follow the money, but also being able to build um, 
you know, data systems and detection systems to more proactively go looking for these networks and be able to continue to make, you know, the cryptocurrency industry a safer place. Okay, that's all for Crypto World today. We'll be back again tomorrow and we'll see you then.